We've all seen that person before. Super lean jawline, lean face, lean arms. They look like just great and then all of a sudden you look at their waistline and it's like, whoop, that was a 20 yard fake. There's this big old pot belly. Well, that is called the visceral to subcutaneous fat ratio and it really does make a difference. We're gonna talk about it a little bit but the focus of this video is how do you know that you have relatively high or even moderately high levels of visceral fat if you don't have like regular access to a DEXA scan or an MRI or all kinds of like expensive devices or procedure? I mean, it's, there are some basic ways. Now we're still uncovering them, but if you start looking at the data and you start looking at a little bit of correlation, not always causation, you can start to at least connect the dots a little bit. The first thing that is probably the most glaringly obvious Visceral fat is fat that is not really, it's visible, but it's not like the typical jiggling kind of fat that's grabbable, right? That is subcutaneous fat. So the simplest thing is, if you have a bigger waist, but you can't really grab it, it's really tight and hard, it's probably visceral fat. Okay, now we'll talk a little bit more about this. So let's go ahead and dive in. Now we used to use things like BMI, right? BMI is where you take someone's height and weight and you ultimately determine if they're obese or overweight. Now, people bag on BMI, but the reality is BMI is a great indicator, typically, if someone is overweight or obese. In fact, it's over 90% accurate. So it really is good for the majority of people, but it tells us nothing about muscle, tells us nothing about the fat ratio, and it definitely doesn't tell us anything about visceral fat. So scrap BMI, okay? Even most you know, clinicians are moving away from that. Then you can look at regular body fat percentage. Does that tell you much? Well, if you look with calipers, where you're measuring your extremities and measuring your abdomen and stuff like that, sure, calipers can give you somewhat of an indicator of your body fat percentage, but once again, it does not tell you what your visceral fat levels are. Then there's things like a DEXA scan, right? Where you're actually going in and getting basically a CT scan. That's, the, that's probably the only way that most people know of. Then there's something called bioimpedance, bioimpedic scales. You've all seen those scales you hold onto with your hands or the ones that have the little metal feet that you stand on the scales, right? Well, what those do is those send a signal up through your body. Now, muscle and fat, water, they all have different currents, right? So they measure differently. So when these electrical currents are sent through you, there's different feedback speeds. And that's how these scales determine, oh, this is how much fat you have, this is how much muscle you have, etc. However, there's some big issues with it because it's not an actual measurement. They are data points. In fact, there was a study that was published in the Libyan Journal of Medicine that when they looked at bioimpedic testing, they found that just 500 milliliters of water overestimated a body fat percentage by 2%. A whole liter of water overestimated body fat percentage by 3.8%. Okay, so that one's kind of thrown away, right? Now, visceral fat is very important to measure. Okay, there was a study that was published in the journal MedRx. Okay, it found that when you were looking at cardiometabolic markers. So cardiometabolic, things like diabetes, things like that affect our cardiovascular system and our metabolic drive, right? Our metabolic system. Well, they found that visceral fat was the largest indicator of just overall health. And only visceral fat was associated with like an increased risk of death. Abdominal fat that was like subcutaneous, like the, again, the jiggly grabbable fat, that was kind of neutral. Kind of, sounds kind of crazy, right? That abdominal fat really wasn't all that bad. Thigh fat may even have like a benefit. I don't think that you should just go out and try to gain as much weight around your thighs as you possibly can. But it's just interesting when you look that all fats are not created equal. Um, I'm gonna list off a few things that are very basic. I'm gonna talk about different measurements you can take in terms of things with a tape measure. I'm gonna talk about different blood levels and uh, plasma markers that you can take a look at in terms of testing. Uh, I will go ahead and recommend something that I've been using. It's called Bello. Bello is a visceral fat monitoring device, measurement device, and it's using an actual measurement versus just collecting data points. It's using near-infrared technology. So you hold the device up against your belly button or above your belly button, and then again below your belly button, and using near-infrared technology, it gives you a pretty darn accurate, in fact, a very accurate reading of where your visceral fat levels are. Now, Bello is a sponsor on this channel, okay? They have sponsored this video, which is great because that's information that needs to get out there, but it's absolutely worth checking out. In fact, if you use the code Thomas Bello, you can save $20 off of a Bello device. So I went ahead and I put that link down below in the description. You use code Thomas Bello and it gets you $20 off of a Bello visceral fat monitoring system. It really is interesting. Okay, when you're looking at different data points that you can get when you're on your different regimes and different uh, you know, regimens, 
it's really interesting to see what is making a positive difference, what's making a negative difference. It also comes with some nutrition guidelines, some exercise guidelines to kind of help you hone in on your visceral fat sort of management. So you can really manage it from home. Totally wicked cool device. And again, that link is down below and a thank you to Bello for sponsoring this content. So the first thing that you can do when you're at home is measure your waistline. This sounds funny, okay? But we have to look at, again, the different studies and the correlation and how much it makes sense. So there's a study that was published in the journal Circulation, took a look at over 44,000 people, 44,600 people. They found that women that were over the age of 16 that had a waist circumference of 35 inches or more ended up having 2x the risk of death compared to women that had a 28 inch waist. Okay. Again, correlation does not always equal causation. And with men, that number was bumped up to 40. So men with waists over 40 inches were 2x likely the risk of death. Now again, measuring your waist does not necessarily tell you everything, right? If you measure your waist and it's 40 inches, that doesn't tell you if it's visceral fat, but it's still a very good indicator because generally, if you have central adiposity, there is a good chance that it is probably some being visceral fat, right? Then if you look at a study that was published in the journal Obesity, they found that just one kilogram of visceral fat mass was associated with two times the risk of death compared to half a kilogram of visceral fat mass. So we know that there's a pretty clear like kind of line with more visceral fat, more risk. But then, like I opened this video, I talked about that visceral to sub-Q ratio. That matters. It's called the VSR. It's our visceral fat to subcutaneous fat ratio. And it kind of comes back again to, like you see those people that are lean, but if they have high levels of visceral fat, that can actually be worse. It can actually be worse if you are lean and have low subcutaneous fat, but high visceral fat. That is literally worse or seemingly than having moderate sub-Q fat and high visceral fat. The leaner and less sub-Q fat you have in accordance with more visceral fat seems to be worse. It's kind of weird and we don't really know the full connections why, but perhaps regular subcutaneous fat offers a little bit of protection. Again, I'm not saying you go out and get fat just to protect yourself. It's just interesting looking at the data. So what you do is you measure your waist, like I mentioned in the beginning. Okay, if you're over 35 inches for women, over 40 inches for men, Okay, then you are in the risk category, right? But what you do from there on is you go ahead and you grab your fat, right? If you can grab it, it's actually a sigh of relief. You're like, okay, if I can grab a handful, that means it's more sub-Q fat, all right? But if you cannot grab a handful and your waist is still that big, you might wanna start taking some measures to potentially modulate that visceral fat level, right? And I have videos on that. So anyhow, moving on. The next one is your waist to height ratio, okay? again. Getting the good old fashioned measuring tape, it plays a big role. There was a study that was published in the journal Scientific Reports, took a look at 603 people and it gave them a DEXA scan. And then it cross-referenced their DEXA scan. Remember, it's kind of like a CT scan that kind of looks at that stuff. And they cross-referenced it with some measurements. They found the waist to height ratio was the next best indicator of you know, cardiometabolic disease, risk factors, all of that next to, of course, the overall waist measurement. So actually taking a look at your height and waist plays a big role. So what you do is you take your waist measurement and you divide it by your height. I would recommend doing it in centimeters to make it easy. So measure your waist in centimeters, measure your height in centimeters, and divide the two. If you are less than 0.5, if that ratio is less than 0.5, you are typically in a pretty good spot, at least based upon this study. If you are over 0.5, well, there's probably a chance that you have that central adiposity that could be correlated with that visceral fat. But then what do you do? You do the secondary test. So if, if I measured and I was a 0.8, I would say, uh-oh, it looks as though my you know, visceral fat might be high. So the next step, I go ahead and I squeeze my belly. Uh-oh, I'm pretty lean. That's a problem. If my waist is big, but I'm lean, that's a good indicator that's probably that pot belly visceral fat. There are some exceptions. Maybe you train your obliques a lot. Maybe you have big muscles. Okay, that could factor in. Let's look at the next one, which are gonna be plasma biomarkers. These are really interesting because these are things that you could maybe do uh, if you get some blood work done and you wanna get these things tested. Now, I'm gonna show you some that are associated with low levels of visceral fat and some that are associated with high levels of visceral fat. There was a cool study published in the journal Metabolomics looked at 176 participants, okay? And it had them go undergo MRI and then it gave them uh, some blood plasma levels, like, or tested their blood plasma levels. They tested a few things. One of the things that they found was something called lysophosphatidylcholine. Okay, lysophosphatidylcholine as well as alkyl phosphatidylcholine 
And the other one was sphingomyelins. Okay, so these three things, when in high amounts, were associated with low levels of visceral fat. Again, that's lysophosphatidylcholine, that's alkylphosphatidylcholine, and sphingomyelins. Okay, they sound weird, but you could actually look them up and get tests for them. You could ask your doctor, right? Okay, well, here's what's interesting. What is going on here? Well, there was a study that was published in the journal Diabetes that found that these same markers, these same lysophosphatidylcholine, et cetera, were also associated with lower levels of diabetes, meaning there is some cardiometabolic effect going on there. Maybe it has to do with insulin resistance because what's funny is insulin resistance also plays a role with visceral fat as well as hormones and all this stuff that all ties in together. So the direct connection, we don't necessarily know. Okay, but those levels are associated with nice low levels of visceral fat. So you want high levels of those for low visceral fat. What about the opposite? Well, there's a study that was published in the journal PLOS1, took a look at 60 people, and it found that leptin and C-reactive protein levels were associated with visceral fat. So high leptin, high C-reactive protein was associated with high visceral fat. Okay, that has to do with the inflammatory cytokines that are released out of the visceral fat. That has to do with leptin resistance, which is also associated with obesity. So you start looking, those are easy measures to get. C-reactive protein is a great measurement. So if you wanted to cross-reference any of these things that I've talked about before, the waist to hip ratio, using your bellow device, uh, bioimpedic, all the different things that you're doing, and then also just go simply get a CRP test, it could probably tell you quite a bit. The other thing that we have to look at is a low ratio of leptin to adenopectin. Leptin is a hormone that's communicating with your brain. Adenopectin is associated with fat liberation. So having a low ratio of that is also indicated with high levels of visceral fat. Believe it or not, also low levels of vitamin D3 are associated with high levels of visceral fat. So you start measuring all these things. Again, it's all kind of you know chopping at it one bit at a time to kind of figure out where you're at if you don't want to go get a DEXA scan. What's interesting though, there was a study published in the journal Nutrients that found that lycopene had a positive association with visceral fat. So higher levels of lycopene coming in through the diet were associated with lower levels of visceral fat. That's in things like tomatoes, watermelon, tomato sauces, uh, some of these other nightshades, things like that. That plays a role. They actually found in this study in uh, journal Nutrients that eight weeks of consuming high lycopene rich foods ended up associating with lower levels of visceral fat pretty phenomenal. Now there's a lot of research to still be done there. So I'm going to recap what you can do here. Okay. Obviously the first step, grab your fat. If you know you have a pot belly and you look in the mirror, grab your fat. If there's nothing to grab, it's kind of tight. You got some work to do. Okay. Then measure your waist. 35 for women, 40 for men. Height to waist ratio. 0.5 is the number that you want to be underneath. Okay. Then when you're measuring your blood markers, C-reactive protein should be nice and low. Okay, leptin levels should be nice and low. Okay, hopefully we wanna eat foods that are rich in lycopene. And we wanna see high levels of lysophosphatidylcholine. We wanna see nice high levels of alkylphosphatidylcholine. And we wanna see nice high levels of spingomyelins. That sounds complicated, but trust me, this is probably the best way that you can get an accurate picture, at least to some degree. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow. Don't forget to check out Bello and big thank you to them for the support.